Hi everyone, welcome back to another true crime and makeup video. Today we're going to be covering the case of Anthony Hardy, also known as the Camden Ripper. And this is such a horrific story. I never actually heard about it until recently. So there's a chance that you guys may not have heard about it as well, because for some reason this case is just not really spoken about a lot. I don't know why now that I know what happens in this case, I don't know why more people don't know about it. I mean, maybe they do, maybe I've just been living in this bubble. But you'll have to let me know if you know about this case, because I didn't. This case takes place in Camden, London. That's why he's called the Camden Ripper. And at the time, he was the most wanted man in the UK. So yeah, I don't know why I don't know about this case. And oh God, this case makes my blood boil. You'll know why. You will understand completely why this case makes my blood boil. But this case highlights so many failures in the UK system. I don't want to give anything away, but this man was basically caught red-handed and then just let free to do what the hell he wanted. So yeah, let's jump into today's case. Ugh. Okay, so Anthony Hardy was born on the 31st of May, 1951, making him a Gemini. And he grew up in Burton-upon-Trent, which is just a town in the Midlands in England. And he had a pretty normal childhood, like nothing out of the ordinary. His dad was a miner and they were just a typical working class family. And growing up in the 60s in a working class family where the father was a miner, there was kind of an expectation that Anthony would follow in his father's footsteps and become a miner himself. But but Anthony didn't want this. He didn't see this as a very successful career. He wanted to do better for himself. And Anthony was actually very intelligent. He really excelled in school and he managed to pass his 11 plus exams. I don't actually think they do those anymore, do they? <laughs> no, I don't think they do. But basically he passed an exam to get into grammar school. Now, Anthony was one of those people that was just extremely arrogant about his intelligence. And he just always thought that he was the smartest in the room. When he was growing up as well, he was also described as very charismatic and very good at engaging people in conversations. He's also been described as being someone that was very popular with girls and he was very charming. He was able to charm all of the girls. After finishing school, he did get a place at Imperial College London, which is a very prestigious school, very hard to get into. And he studied engineering. And while he was at uni, this is when he met Judith, who would become his wife. And they just immediately kind of fell in love clicked, you know, and then when they left uni, they did get married. And after graduating, Anthony did manage to get himself a very good job at a company called British Sugar, which I don't know if it exists anymore, but at the time it was one of the biggest food companies in Europe. And it was just like a very like good job. It was a very stable job. It paid very well. It was very professional. And Judith and Anthony at this point were just like very settled. They were married at this point. They went on to have four kids, three boys and one girl. I feel like this is just a pattern in a lot of these stories now, but everything just seems really good, doesn't it? Well, as we know, it doesn't always stay like that. Well, Anthony had to do a lot of traveling with his job. And when he started to travel, he started to visit prostitutes and started to have affairs. And it didn't stop there. Over time, he started to gain a real big obsession with very violent sex. Quite a few women have reported that when they were having sex with Anthony, he would strangle them. And I mean, really strangle them to the point where they couldn't breathe and they thought that they were going to die. And not only was he visiting prostitutes and having affairs, he was also becoming very verbally and physically abusive to his wife, Judith, and all four kids. He was just extremely volatile. His personality literally was a light switch. Sometimes he was extremely happy. He was extremely friendly. Remember, he does have a very charming personality. Sometimes he was so amazing and loving to be around. And then at other times he was extremely moody. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He would just like sit and not like even acknowledge anybody. And then at the worst of times, he was very, very abusive. Now, Judith at first was quite sympathetic with Anthony. She thought he was just suffering from stress due to his work and she did her best to try and support her husband. And obviously Judith wasn't aware of what Anthony was doing when he was traveling for work. And Judith in supporting her husband did convince him to go to a doctor to seek help for the stress that he was going through. And he was diagnosed with depression and he was prescribed antidepressants. However, to make the whole situation worse. Anthony actually lost his job. Uh, it was due to the recession in the 70s. A lot of people lost their jobs, but Anthony lost his job and this just made him even more volatile. It was extremely difficult for Judith and the children to be around him. He was just 
I mean, you can imagine, can't you? But something soon came along to cheer Anthony up again. He was actually offered a new job and this time his job was going to be in Australia. As predicted, his mood definitely changed for the better and he was getting really excited about this possible move, about this possible new job. He was trying to convince Judith and the children that their lives would be so much better if they emigrated. And that's exactly what he did. Judith was like, yeah, you know what? This could be a really good opportunity for us. Let's move to Australia. And that is what they did. They moved to the island of Tasmania. And once they arrived, Anthony went back to that really loving, friendly, really good father, really good husband, and everything seemed to be great again, but that didn't last for long, did it? It didn't take long for Anthony to start craving violent sex again, and he quickly resumed his old ways by visiting prostitutes in secret again. And then I don't know exactly when this happened, I couldn't find out, but again, Anthony lost his job. Like, I don't know how long it took for him to lose his job, and I also don't know why he did lose his job, but when he lost his job, his mood swings returned, his depression returned and again he became impossible to be around. The abuse towards Judith and the kids started up again but this time it was so much worse because it was at this time that he decided that he wanted to kill his wife and he decided he wanted to make it look like an accident. His plan was to make it look like his wife had accidentally drowned in the bath. And guys, this is where it gets scary how intelligently and meticulously he planned out this murder. So in order to drown his wife in the bath and make it look like an accident, he first needed to knock out his wife so there was no evidence of a struggle and he thought that if he hit her on the head to knock her out completely he could make out that she had slipped in the bath and hit her head off something and that is how she drowned. However, Anthony realized that he couldn't leave any signs on the body of a weapon that had knocked Judith out. So what was his plan? A frozen water bottle. If he froze a bottle of water it would become hard enough to knock somebody out. However, once the water had defrosted, the water bottle would go back to a softer object that definitely could not knock somebody out. He could clean up the bottle and just throw it away with other water bottles and nobody would ever look at an empty water bottle and think that it was a murder weapon. Remember how arrogant he is? He really does think that he would be able to get away with this. And to be honest, in this case, like <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. This man gets away with so much. I wouldn't be surprised if he did get away with it. However, his plan didn't exactly go to plan. So one night after Judith went to bed, Anthony ran a bath. He went and collected his frozen water bottle, snuck into the bedroom while Judith was sleeping and hit her on the head. He then dragged her to the bathroom and he forced her head under the water. But like I said, things did not go to plan. Judith was still semi-conscious. Anthony hadn't hit her hard enough to completely knock her out clean. And when he put her head under water, this kind of did make her stir a little bit. She did kind of wake up a little bit and she was able to gather enough strength to get her head above water and she started to scream. And all of this noise woke up the four children. Yes, the children are still in the house while their father is trying to murder their mom. I don't know why I, I found that significant, but yeah, the children are still in the house and the children ran into the bathroom to see what the hell was going on. And then the children, understandably, were very distressed. They were screaming because they just walked in on their father trying to drown their mom. And I don't know if it was her children screaming, but Judith did seem to regain full consciousness at this point and she did get enough strength to completely fight Anthony off and the police were phoned. I don't know who phoned the police. I don't know if it was one of the children. I don't know if Judith managed to get to a phone. And thankfully, Anthony was arrested and Judith did survive and he was arrested before fatal harm could come to any of them because I tell you what, this man is really capable of anything. So after Anthony is arrested, the police obviously take him in for questioning, but Anthony has a plan up his sleeve. Remember, he's very arrogant. He thinks that he can outsmart every single person in the room. And guess what? He did. I can't believe it. I honestly can't believe it. The police start questioning him, like, why the hell do you try and kill your wife? And Anthony just like cuts in. He's like, oh no, 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 no. I have issues. I need professional help. I can't be blamed for my actions. Basically, his plan was to avoid prosecution, avoid going to prison. And he tries to convince the police that he should go to a psychiatric hospital instead. And he gets what he wants. He manages to convince the police. Sorry, I shouldn't say convince. He manages to manipulate the police into not charging him 
at all. All the police ask for is that he spends some time in a psychiatric hospital. And unfortunately, domestic abuse was not taken seriously at all at this time. And the police marked this as a domestic incident. It was attempted murder. <laughs> It wasn't a domestic incident, it was attempted murder. So while Anthony is in a psychiatric hospital, Judith knows now that she's got to get away from this man. She's got to get her and her children as far away as she possibly can. So while he's in the hospital, she does return back to the UK. And while Anthony is in the hospital, he puts on another act. He knows that if he is a model patient, he will be released a lot quicker. So he's all polite, he's being very respectful, kind of sucking up to all of the staff. And before you know it, he is deemed no longer a threat to the public and he's just released with no supervision or anything no checkups nothing no just released back into the world and when he's released he quickly realizes that judith and the kids have moved they're no longer there i don't know if he knew that they were in the uk or just assumed that they were that they went back to the uk um but he did come back to the uk to find them and when anthony arrived in the uk it did not take him long to find judith and the kids and when he does he starts stalking her he starts harassing her he's just tried to kill her you'd think he'd like leave her alone you know give her give her a break but no and judith does actually get a restraining order on Anthony but did that matter to Anthony? No, he breaks that restraining order constantly. And because he does break the restraining order, Anthony does spend a short time in prison. Didn't charm himself out of that one, did he? But it was only a short time and it wasn't long until he was just back out on the streets again. And after this short prison sentence, this did almost seem to start a new chapter in Anthony's life. Not a good one just a different one. But he seemed to leave Judith and the kids alone. He seemed to move on. But uh, unfortunately, he turned his sights to other people and his behavior only got worse. After he was released from prison, Anthony was homeless. And for a, quite a while, he was just kind of floating about. He was living on the streets. He would sometimes stay in hostels. And it was in this period where he did become addicted to drugs and alcohol. As well, in this period, he was diagnosed with diabetes and also manic depression. And he was prescribed drugs for the these conditions and he was definitely abusing those drugs. The lifestyle that Anthony was leading led him to commit some other criminal offences such as theft and he also was charged with violent offences as well. And again Anthony did end up spending a short period of time in prison. Now the timeline of exact years up until this point was a little bit wishy-washy. I couldn't find like exact years of all of this happening. However now it's 1998 and a sex worker has reported that Anthony has raped her. But unfortunately Unfortunately, these charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. And unfortunately, because the victim was a sex worker, the police probably just didn't take any notice. They didn't take her seriously. They didn't really care. So they probably didn't even bother to look very far into this case. And also, not only this one rape, but Anthony was actually investigated for three other rapes of sex workers. But again, all charges in these rapes were dropped due to lack of evidence. And these are four rapes that we know of. God knows how many there actually were because we all know what Anthony is like. He craves violent sex and he visits sex workers on a regular basis. So these are just the rapes that have been reported. And it's also been reported that Anthony was obsessed with Jack the Ripper. And I mean obsessed, not an interest, obsessed. Now, if you don't know Jack the Ripper, I'm sure you probably do, but just in case you don't, he's a very infamous serial killer back from the 1800s. And he murdered five women that we know of in the Whitechapel area of London. And we don't know who Jack the Ripper is. He was never caught. And I think it's the never caught bit that Anthony was the most obsessed with. We all know, like he thinks he can get away with everything. So people around Anthony have just reported that he would talk about Jack the Ripper all the time. And he was fascinated by how Jack the Ripper outsmarted the police. And now it is 2000 and he moves to Camden, which is an area of London, which I just want to point out is just around the corner from Jack the Ripper territory. And this was also a perfect place for Anthony to live because it was very close to King's Cross, which is known for sex workers and drug dealers. And it didn't take long for Anthony's neighbors to become very uncomfortable with him. I mean, I mean he just had very weird behavior, okay? And not weird in a good way. Like he, he was he was weird in a bad way. And he would wear the same outfit every day. He would wear this long black coat. And neighbors had also said that they could tell by the smell of him, oh God, the smell, um, that he didn't wash very regularly. Oh, and he was just uh, messy and smelly and 
Yeah. And it didn't take long for a serious incident to happen between Anthony and one of his neighbors. So Anthony got very angry at one of his neighbors. It was actually the neighbor that was above him in his flat because one of their pipes was leaking and it was leaking into Anthony's flat, which I get it. I know leak very, very annoying. It sometimes happens. People can't help it. Okay. But Anthony being Anthony got very angry. He's very volatile and he wanted revenge. So he decided he was gonna write foul and degrading, disgusting words on the front door of this neighbor. And I'm not gonna repeat what he said because it's disgusting. But no, that wasn't enough to write all of those things on his neighbor's front door. No, he decided he was gonna pour battery acid through their letterbox. You all know that Anthony thinks that he can get away with everything. He thinks that he's some kind of criminal mastermind. Um, but you didn't really cover your tracks very well, Anthony, because there was footsteps leading from the neighbor's door straight to his front door. He clearly had gotten acid on his shoes and he had literally walked it back to his flat. So they phoned the police, obviously, and the police went straight to Anthony's flat. And when the police arrive, Anthony turns on his charm. He invites the police very politely in and he quickly confesses to his crimes. He quickly confesses that he was the one that poured the battery acid through the letterbox, which the police are like taken aback a bit because like he's so forthcoming with this. And they're just like, okay, this is strange that someone has just so willingly like admitted to this straight away. Like this is pretty serious. And Anthony seems very keen to go to the police station. And the police are like, hmm, suspicious. Who is so keen to come to a police station? Like, I don't feel like anybody, innocent or guilty, would be keen to go to a police station. So the police are like, is he hiding something in here? Let's search his flat. And the police looking around his flat could tell, like, it, it, it was just not normal, you know? There was satanic, like, artwork on the walls. It was very messy. It also smelled really bad. But they start searching around the flat and they come across this door and it's locked. And the police are like, Give us the key. We want to see what's behind this locked door. But Anthony's like, I don't have a key. That's not my room. I don't know what's in there. I actually have a lodger, so I can't go into that room, which of course he didn't have a lodger. And then Anthony instinctively picks up his coat, which the police took note of, because it's like, why are, you, why are you picking up your coat? So the police take the coat off Anthony. They search the coat. And what do you know? The key is in the coat. You're not really that clever, are you, Anthony? So when the police opened the door, there was such a strong, foul scent coming from that room. I mean, the whole flat smelled, but the main smell was definitely coming from this room. So when the police go into the room, there is more satanic artwork on the walls. They also find a mountain of pornographic videotapes. But before they saw any of this, their eyes were immediately drawn to the bed that was in the room because on the bed, there was a naked female body with a devil's mask covering her face. And tragically, this woman wasn't alive. The body had been positioned in a very degrading sexual position. And there was also filming equipment as well set up at the end of the bed. The woman had suffered both head and neck injuries. And there was also a significant bite mark on her leg. There was a bucket of soapy water next to the bed as well and when one of the officers felt the water which oh god I wouldn't want to do that because you just you just never know what could have been in that water but they felt the water and the water was still warm. Police quickly concluded that they had literally interrupted Anthony in doing whatever he was doing and the victim was Sally White and I tried to find information about her but I couldn't really find anything like I couldn't even find out her exact age because there are some reports that she was 31 and some reports that she was 38 but it is thought that she lived in the Camden area and the only thing that is known about Sally White is that she was a sex worker at the time. There are also some reports that she may have been Anthony's neighbor. There was also some reports that she could have been the lodger but we just don't know. So they arrest Anthony because they've just found a dead body in his flat. And that should be the end of the video, shouldn't it? Like he's been arrested for murder. I should just be going through the trial and the sentencing and all stuff like that. But he's not. Well, if people had bloody done their job properly, he would have been. However, Anthony does somehow, 
God, I cannot believe what happens, but somehow Anthony does avoid prosecution for this murder. So during the interview, Anthony cooks up this little plan. And just like he did before when he attempted to murder his wife, he interrupted the police and said, I have psychological problems. I'm an alcoholic. I have no idea how that body got into my flat. You have no idea. <laughs> it's your bloody flat. How do you not have any idea? And he just pleaded ignorance. He just was like, I don't know how we got here. I don't know how any of this happened. And what is just so shocking about this case, I truly cannot believe it. Like this shouldn't be real. This is like from a film or something. But somehow the pathologist, Dr. Freddy Patel, concluded that Sally White had died of a heart attack and that there was no foul play involved. I just, oh my God, I, oh my God. Can you see why this case makes my blood boil now? He reported that she had died from, quote, blocked arteries and shock generated by rough sex, end quote. I mean, what, seriously, what? She, uh, she died of natural causes? I'm sorry, okay, let's just play devil's advocate here and pretend like this is all true and she did die of a heart attack, but she still died because of the rough sex, which clearly did involve Anthony. Surely he should be liable for something. And the police just didn't believe this. They didn't believe that she had died from natural causes and they ordered another autopsy, which is actually quite rare. But again, from this second autopsy, the results came back the same, that she died from a heart attack. I'm sorry, but this screams corruption to me. Like what the hell is going on? Where is AC12 when you need them? And amazingly, like I said, Anthony seemed to avoid all prosecution for this murder and all charges were dropped. Apparently they found no evidence that Anthony had killed Sally White. I mean, they found her body in his flat. He was clearly cleaning up the body. There was filming equipment. He locked the door, he concealed the body. Hmm, yeah, no evidence. And in the end, the police only charged Anthony for the damage to the neighbor's flat. Remember he poured battery acid in through her door? And even then, he managed to avoid prison. I just don't know how this man seems to just get away with everything. I mean, I know he thinks he is the smartest in the room, but unfortunately, it seems like he was. So instead of going to prison like he should have, again, he goes to a psychiatric hospital. What I want to know is that he had this dead body in his flat. He knew he had this dead body in his flat, yet he still went to the neighbor's house and poured battery acid through their letterbox. It's like, why would you do that when you have a dead body in your flat? Maybe he was just really arrogant and thought that he did literally run this little flat complex and nobody would ever report him for anything. And when he was in the psychiatric hospital, psychiatrists did say that he was high risk to women and they did not want to let him go. Like they saw that he was dangerous. However, this is not Anthony's first time in a psychiatric hospital and it's not his first time manipulating professionals. And he knew that if he became a model patient again, he would probably be released. And this is exactly what he did. He became that model patient again, charmed everyone around him. And just 11 months later, in November, 2002, he was released back out into the world. Even though psychiatrists had said not too long before that he was a danger to women, good behavior or not, you shouldn't be released if you're dangerous. Don't get how he was able to do this. These people are supposed to be professionals. I know that all of us can be manipulated. I know professionals are just humans at the end of the day, but it is their profession. <laughs> they should be able to recognize, oh, this person's dangerous. He's had quite a few incidents in the past. Let's keep an eye on him. Let's not fall for his charm. So he was literally just released back into the world as if nothing had happened. And he just went back to his old life. He went back to his flat and the neighbors at this point were just so terrified of him because I don't know, he just seems to get away with everything. He continued on visiting sex workers and he would regularly invite them back to his flat. And somehow, I, I cannot believe this either. I cannot believe it. Somehow, Anthony managed to get a prescription for Viagra. <sighs> like, I just, <laughs> 
I can't. I'm laughing because it's just so unbelievable. Sexual predators should not be able to get a prescription for Viagra. It's like surely something should have been flagged in the system here. So now that Anthony is back out in the open, I'm sure it's not hard for you to guess exactly what happens next. I mean, he has just murdered someone. I think we all know where this is going. And his idol is Jack Ripper and he's just gotten away with a murder. I bet he thinks he literally is the next Jack Ripper. In the early hours of the 30th of December, 2002, a homeless man is just going about his usual routine and he's searching for food in just these really big bins in Camden not too far from Anthony's flat. And these are like these big community shared bins. So quite a few of the flats nearby would be using these bins. And inside the bin, the man came across two black bags. And after poking these bags, the man could feel something like meat inside. He said that he thought that inside the bags were two big salmons. He unwrapped what he thought was two big salmons, and we all know that those weren't two big salmons. In fact, they were two dismembered human legs. And the man contacted the police immediately who cordoned off the area. And they start searching the rest of the bins and the surrounding areas to try and find any clues. And inside the exact same big wheelie bin, they find more human remains. The remains that they found was half a female torso. But after testing, this torso belonged to a different victim than the legs. Police now realize that they don't just have one victim on their hands, they have two. They immediately halt all bin collections in the local area. They spend so much time going through all of the bins in the local area to try and find like the remaining parts of these two victims. Like, can you even imagine how long that would have taken to search all of these bins in the local area? But they didn't find anything. So after 36 hours, they decide to widen their search a little bit further out and they start searching bins in a wider area. And as soon as they do this, what do they find? More human remains. In a different wheelie bin, they find a right arm, a left arm, also a left foot, and another part of a torso. And all of these body parts did belong to the same two victims from the other parts found. Police have found a significant amount of body parts now that are these two victims. And the police, because of the area they're in, they're in Camden and they are right by Anthony's flat. The police are aware of Anthony and the previous discovery of a dead body in his flat. So immediately Anthony does become a suspect. After questioning all the neighbors as well, like they're all pointing their finger at Anthony because why wouldn't they? They're all suspicious of him. They're all scared of him. They think if there's anybody that's gonna be responsible for all of these body parts, it's going to be Anthony. So the police make their way to Anthony's flat and Anthony is nowhere to be found. However, inside of his flat, the police make more shocking discoveries. In the middle, there's just this big black bin bag with all of these tools on top of it. And I feel like we all know what's in this bag. So the police unwrap this black bag and inside is another part of a female torso. And among the tools that are scattered around the flat and the ones on top of the black bin bag, um, was a hacksaw, several knives, and an electric power saw. And on all of these tools, there was still human flesh attached to all of them. There's also pools of blood just everywhere. And there's also pieces of skin and flesh just on the walls. Like, how did that get on the walls? I don't understand. And to discover more about the crime scene, the police use what was then a new technique called Lumia, which is a chemical. And when it's applied, it will show where blood has been even if it's been cleaned up. So they apply this chemical and oh my God, you can see from the pictures that blood has pretty much been everywhere in this flat. There is so much blood, it's all up the walls. There's evidence of bodies being dragged. There's blood all in the bath. I mean, it's everywhere. And when the neighbors were questioned, they said that they could hear drilling coming from Anthony's flat at all hours of the day and night. I think they just thought he was doing DIY. Oh God, but we know what he was doing. So after the search on the flat and the bins in the local area, the police do have most of the body parts from the two victims, but both of the heads and the hands were still missing from both of the victims. They did manage to identify the two victims and one of the victims was Bridget McLennan, who was age 34 and originally from New Zealand. And she was a mother to two sons. And then the other victim was Elizabeth Vallad and she was aged 29 and she was from the Nottingham area and she was 
also a mother to a daughter. And it's just so heartbreaking that these three children lost their mother because of this sick, disgusting man. Following all of these discoveries and because Anthony hasn't been found, a manhunt quickly goes underway and he quickly becomes the most wanted man in the UK. His face is everywhere. It's printed on every single newspaper. It's shown on every single news show, but the police still can't find him. And as it turns out, Anthony wasn't really even on the run. He was still in Camden. How could the police not find him? I do not know. He was also wearing his long black coat and his baseball cap, which is what he always wore every single day. The only thing that he did to change his appearance was he shaved his beard off. Like he was still pretty recognizable though. He ended up just sleeping in hospital waiting rooms in the local area whilst he was on the run for the police. I just don't know how they couldn't find him. I mean, he's in London, he's in Camden. Occasionally, Anthony would even return to the crime scene. A few times he returned to the area just to kind of see what was going on, just to like nosy on the police and the investigation. I bet he was loving this. Like they knew he had done it, but they couldn't find him. I bet he really did think that he was Jack the Ripper. So three days pass. Yeah, three days. How did the police not find him? But three days pass. Anthony's still on the run, but an off-duty officer does spot him at a hospital because he's there to pick up his medication. So he immediately phones the police and is like, Anthony Hardy is here, you know, you better come and get him. And Anthony catches wind that the police are on their way. So he does hide behind some bins at the back of the hospital, but the police officers thankfully did find him this time. And Anthony did not come peacefully. He managed to knock one of the police officers unconscious. And then I don't know how he did this. I don't know what he used, but he stabbed the other police officer through the hand and dislocated his eye socket. Don't know how he did this, but despite all of this, the officers did manage to detain him until backup arrived and Anthony finally, thankfully, was arrested. So once he was arrested, he was taken to the police station for questioning and he did not cooperate at all to every single question. He just replied, no comment. That's a green bin, Tony, with a black lid on it. Exactly the same as the one behind the pub. Do you know that bin at all? No comment. Have you ever used that bin, Tony? No comment. Have you ever gone to that bin at all? No comment. Have you ever put any rubbish in it? No comment. Have you ever taken any rubbish out of it? No comment. As part of their investigation, the police did find this huge stack of photographs and I haven't seen the photographs. I do not want to see the photographs. I've read descriptions of what are on the photographs and they are absolutely horrific. I do not want to see them. Nobody should see these photographs. But before Anthony went on the run, he gave these photographs to a friend and he told this friend to keep these photographs at all costs. Do not lose them. Do not let them out of your sight because Anthony really did believe that he was going to outsmart the police and he wasn't going to get caught and he wanted these photographs back because these photographs were his trophies and these photographs were of the victims Elizabeth and Bridget and in the photos both Bridget and Elizabeth were posed in very degrading sexual positions and also like Sally White they both had the devil's mask over their face. The police showed these photographs to Anthony in the interview because they wanted to invoke some kind of reaction from him. They wanted to get to the bottom of this and they were hoping that these photographs would help but it didn't. Anthony just looked at the photographs and he wasn't phased at all. He didn't have like a normal human response. He was just so cold. Do you recognize this as your bedroom? No comment. Okay. Let's look at this one then. It's the same lady. What have we got on that lady's head, Mr. Hardy? What can you see? No comment. All the police wanted out of Anthony was where the heads and the hands were of both Elizabeth and Bridget. Like they had enough evidence to charge Anthony for the murders. They didn't want any more information. I mean, obviously they did, but they just wanted where the heads and the hands were so they could give them back to the victim's families and so that they could just have closure. But Anthony did not give up this information. He was determined to hold on to this information and he didn't give it up. Well, I fear the questions we have to put to you today are coming to an end. And I'm going to end with that impassionate plea again, Mr. Hardy. You're the only person I believe that knows where those heads and hands are. Your opportunity, please, to tell me now so I can recover them for the family, not for me, Mr. Hardy. What can you do for me? No comment. 
So Anthony's trial took place in November 2003 for the murders of both Bridget and Elizabeth. And at first he denied any involvement with both of the murders. However, once he realized the overwhelming evidence against him, he did change his plea to guilty. And then shockingly, like no one was expecting this, out of the blue, he also admitted to the murder of Sally White. Remember Sally White, who was deemed to have died from natural causes of a heart attack? Yeah, he finally confessed to her murder as well. During the trial, the prosecution described how Anthony carried out the murders. He lured all of his victims back to his flat on the pretenses of both drugs and money. He would then engage in sexual activity with the victims. I don't know if this was consensual or not. In some cases, I can guarantee you it wasn't. And then Anthony would strangle his victims. Anthony was described as a pornographic obsessed necrophiliac. Now, Anthony had always wanted to dismember a body and this was his plans with Sally White. But remember that he got interrupted by the police. Well, when he was released from the psychiatric hospital, he was determined to carry out his sick plans. And he was fixated on these plans. Like he was gonna carry out his plans no matter what. And Anthony was found guilty, obviously. Thankfully, he didn't charm his way out of this one. And he was sentenced to three life sentences. And he is one of the rare cases that life really does mean life in the UK. The police also think that Anthony could be responsible for a lot more murders than just the three that we know of. They think that he could be responsible for up to six murders that happened in the local area that all kind of happened around the same kind of time and in the same kind of way. But unfortunately for these other murders, there's not enough evidence to actually tie them to Anthony, even though there is a strong suspicion. And there was so much anger towards the police because of this case, understandably so. I mean, they literally freed him to kill again. And there was actually a public inquiry held because of this case, because of how many faults and how many things went wrong in this case. And the people that decided that Anthony was no longer a threat to society were actually pressured into resigning. However, they said that it wasn't their fault that they found him no longer a threat to society. They said that Anthony was a master manipulator and that they couldn't be blamed for being manipulated by him. Um, it's like, that's what you're supposed to be there for. And they said that no one was to blame apart from Anthony, which I get, like obviously Anthony is to blame for his crimes, but you are professionals. You are there in that position to try and prevent people from Anthony being able to commit the crimes that he did. And remember Freddie Patel, the pathologist, the one that ruled Sally White's death as a heart attack, which was obviously not true because Anthony has confessed to the murder. Well, it turns out that he carried on working for seven more years after this case. And then in 2009, he was the pathologist on another high profile case. And in that case, again, he falsely reported that the death was a heart attack. And because of this, because it was a high profile case and he was looked into, he was finally, finally suspended. And it was actually found out that he had misreported the deaths on many other cases. He was banned from ever practicing medicine again in the UK. I mean, he should be banned from practicing medicine anywhere. And then to conclude this story in November, 2020, Anthony Hardy did die in prison after contracting sepsis. And he also did have COVID, but I don't think he died of COVID, maybe complications with COVID, but he actually died of sepsis. So can you now see why this case makes my blood boil? It's like there were so many failures along the whole way from the people in psychiatric hospitals to the police. Oh my God. It's like if we go right back to the beginning of the story, if the attempted murder on his wife was just taken seriously, none of this would have happened. All of this could have been prevented. But then even after the murder of Sally White, he was just free to commit at least two more murders, if not possibly more. Oh my God, I can't believe it. It's just so frustrating that people lost their lives unnecessarily and this could have been prevented and the victim's families have lost a loved one that they can never get back. So let me know all of your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. Does this case make your blood boil as much as it makes mine? And also please give me case suggestions because I always want to know what you want to hear next and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.